next week's video of true crimes based on the plot of American Horror Story, um, I had been focusing on all the crimes that are linked to the Cecil Hotel. So I will link the playlist up here. So far, you can see videos on the Cecil Hotel, on the Black Dahlia, Elizabeth Short. I also just finished up a two-part on the Night Stalker, who was Richard Ramirez. And so now we're moving on to Jack Unterweger. If you haven't watched those, I'd say watch those first because um, a lot of these are related. They're all related to the Cecil Hotel. But this one in particular is related to the Night Stalker video, so I will link that definitely above so that you can watch that first. Johan Jack Unterweger was born in 1950 to Teresa Unterweger, who was a barmaid in Vienna, and his father, as far as he was concerned, was an unknown American soldier. That wouldn't have been uncommon. Um, I myself was uh, an army baby and I was born overseas, so sometimes those sort of things happened. It is stated in many sources that his mother was not just a barmaid or a waitress, that she was also a prostitute. Um, but I'm not sure that that's like confirmed or anything. Unterweger was in and out of different institutions, jail, correctional facilities, what have you, as he was growing up, mostly like for petty crimes. But he did, you know, have some more serious crimes. He did assault a prostitute uh, as a minor. So it's kind of like, in the first video of the Night Stalker, I went through the characteristics of a serial killer. So if you haven't watched that one, definitely watch that one because the characteristics are there. Um, but obviously, violence as a child, um, being exposed to things as a child that are sexually motivated, such as if his mother was a prostitute and he was aware of it or maybe even witnessed some of it, um, those can be found as contributors. I mean, I'm not sure it's it's safe or it's fair to say like if certain things happen you will become a serial killer i just think it's kind of like a recipe like there are certain things that are always present it's like making soup like you need certain things to make soup now you can add or subtract different things and it would change it um but the basis of soup is always going to be having some certain ingredients and i'm just likening that to serial killers so with jack's story the timeline here is really strange. You almost have to kind of go backwards in time. In 1991, Jack arranged to do some ride-alongs with the LAPD. Uh, he was a writer, he was a crime writer in Europe, and he contacted them and you know let them know that he was doing a piece on crime in LA, and most specifically around prostitution. At that time, like, Crack cocaine was huge in LA, especially, and now this is going to be the area in and around the Cecil Hotel, also known as Skid Row. Um, so there was a lot of drugs, a lot of prostitution. So he did these ride-alongs and he sort of got familiar with the area. He like interviewed prostitutes and later on he would actually victimize those prostitutes, which... You know, if you're doing a ride along with police and then, you know, you're talking to this man, if you see him later, you know, you wouldn't be as cautious as if he were to just to, you know, go up to prostitutes in general to try to lure them in order to kill or assault them. So Jack stated on more than one occasion that he was, let's say, inspired by Richard Ramirez, who was the Night Stalker and who was known to have stayed at the Cecil Hotel during, like, his main killing spree and and he did assaults and some other things as well i'm going to comment more on this later because i have some i have some thoughts about this idea that he wanted to sort of copy ramirez um you know there's this whole area when you're studying killers or serial killers who do like copycat situations if you ever want me to maybe like look into that more and explore more about that just let me know but in general, I kind of call BS on that, and, and I'll tell you why later in the video, why I think him claiming to be wanting to copy Ramirez was bogus, but just, that'll be in the video, just put a pin in that idea. So while he was at the Cecil Hotel and he did these ride-alongs, it was confirmed that he strangled and killed at least three prostitutes. Now... 
because women who get into prostitution either by choice or by force or by circumstance um, it's you know it's a culture that can be easily preyed upon because you're doing something illegal you're doing something that some people find even yourself might find immoral it chips away at your self-esteem to do something like that you you have to sort of you know trade your soul a little bit and so if things happen to you or happen to your friends, you're not going to like quickly run down to the police station and say this happened. So it's my guess that there was probably more, um, but that's just my thought. It's not like confirmed or anything. Going back, so he, he does these murders and he ends up going back um, to Europe, but it was found out later on that he had killed and assaulted women, specifically prostitutes before in Europe. One of the first known murders uh, was in 1974. He murdered a German born named Margaret Schaefer and he strangled her with her own bra which would become a signature of her of his. So ironically he was convicted of that murder and he was sent to jail in Europe for that murder. While he was in prison, he became an award-winning author and playwright. He wrote short stories, poems, plays. He wrote an autobiography entitled Purgatory or the Trip to Prison, Report of a Guilty Man. And it later served as a basis for a documentary. In 1985, there was a campaign to sort of like release prisoners and pardon people. And like, it was about, you know, prisoners that had been reformed. And, you know, especially like other countries, I think, see this differently. Me, myself, I have mixed thoughts and feelings on the ability of people to be reformed. I do think that people can be reformed. I think that people can change. I don't know, at least in our American system, uh, as far as our American prison system and justice system, if that's something that can happen simply because of the basis of how the system is. Do I think that people can be redeemed and can change? Um, yeah, I do. You know, in Europe, they were thinking the same thing. So in 1985, there were people that were saying, like, he's done all this, these things, you know, he he's redeemed, like, he should be released. And the Austrian president at that time actually refused that pardon, and he said that he needed to, like, he needed to at least serve the minimum 15 years. So he had gotten, like, 15 years to life. Writers, artists, journalists, um politicians, socialists, they just would not give up on trying to get him a pardon. And I mean, these, these were Nobel Peace Prize winners, celebrated art, artists, editors of influential magazines. Like they really were like on this about him being pardoned. He did end up being released on May 23rd of 1990, which was the 15 year mark of his life sentence. And he was released as an example of rehabilitation. When he was released, his autobiography was taught in schools and universities as like, you can do these horrible things and you can be rehabilitated. And, you know, like there was like skits performed on the radio based on this. He hosted television programs discussing criminal rehabilitation and he became like a broadcaster and he would report on stories that concerned different murders and crazily enough some of the murders he reported on as a broadcaster he had committed sometimes like some of these things it's just you can really be right next to someone and we don't have to go all like to the place of serial killers but you can really be next to someone who is nothing like you thought like people can really do horrific things and then go to work go do things you know and it's just sometimes it's like mind-blowing back in the Richard Ramirez video I talked about you know some characteristics of serial killers and a lot of times they have sort of this like grandiose idea about themselves they do often like to be inserted some way in the investigations or the media or the what have you which you can see he did and 
you know, they always obviously have have either like antisocial or they will have sort of psychotic personalities, you know, like narcissistic to the next level. You know, it's it is super narcissistic to be lecturing on rehabilitation and crime and things like that when you're still a murderer. Like, that's just another level of thinking. So after Unterweger was released from prison in Europe, there was a series of prostitute murders in Austria and, and some other surrounding European countries. Um, they all had this a similar signature and they were dubbed sort of the they were dubbed the Vienna Woods killer so oftentimes media will name a killer or a series of murders before they know who it is um you know what I should look up like exactly why that is um I don't know if it's like easy easier to pull all the stories together if it's under one like killer name when you don't know who the killer is I'm not sure but if you know please put it down below if not I will look that up but Law enforcement found out later that Unterweger uh, killed a sex worker prostitute in Czechoslovakia and six more in Austria in 1990. So if you remember, he was released in late May of 1990 and he killed at least seven people before he traveled to LA, or no, I'm sorry, he killed at least seven people that same year which doesn't give you a lot of time to be killing people since you're not even out till almost June. So by his admission, um, he began killing again less than four months after his release. So he's been in prison 15 years. He's doing all these different like, you know, I'm reformed. This person could be reformed, all these different things. But within four months, less than four months, he's already killing. And then he killed six people. So if we, if we're, saying June, July, August. So by that end of that summer, he was already killing and he killed like seven people. It's just, it's so, I, can't, I don't even have words for that. So in 1991, he was hired by an Austrian magazine to write about crime in LA. So this was what we were talking about at the beginning of the video of how he even came to LA. He was hired by a magazine and sent over there. I'm sure, you know, a lot of times they'll pitch an idea and I think he was sort of, you know, crack cocaine was huge in LA at the time. So he was probably like, yeah, we should do stories on that, cover that. And they obviously thought that that was a good idea. So they wanted to do this whole spin where the difference between European prostitution and American prostitution and like the attitudes towards prostitution in the different countries. He gets to LA, he goes in to stay at the Cecil Hotel. Like he's obviously sent by a magazine, like, you know, people are sent to Europe and from Europe in terms of covering different stories and things. That's a common practice. Um, but they don't usually put them up at the Cecil Hotel. So for me, if I was working at the magazine, that should have been like a red flag in general um, because they would have had to have known about like the Richard Ramirez and Ice Soccer was huge. Um, they would have had to have been at least familiar with that. I mean, these are journalists. So I, I would kind of be like, like, why are you staying at the Cecil Hotel? Like, that's weird. So he did the ride along with the LAPD and he went to the red light districts, the skid row, and he was introduced to three sex workers specifically while he was on those ride alongs, Shannon Exley, Irene Rodriguez, and Becky Booth. Those three were all beaten and sexually assaulted uh, with tree branches and then they were strangled with their own bras. If you remember that the original murder that he was convicted of, he strangled that woman with her own bra. So meanwhile, because he did this, you know, this is, he killed, what, seven people in, at the end of 1990, and then he travels to the U.S. in 91, so, you know, those murders are still being investigated in Europe, and so, you know, they were looking at different suspects for a while, and then it just, it kept coming sort of back to, we should really look at Unterweger 
for this. He didn't realize it, but while he was in the U.S., because they were on to him, they did sort of keep him on, under surveillance just to make sure that he didn't, you know, go underground, um, if he didn't catch wind of what was happening and, like, disappear in the United States somewhere. So, in the absence of other suspects, they did loop back around to Unterweger, and that he was actually under surveillance before he went to the U.S., you know, under the guise of being a reporter. And they didn't see anything. Like, they didn't see any reason to stop him from going to the U.S. Or, they, you know, they didn't see any connection at that time with these murders. So he was able to go to the U.S., but he was still on their radar. So they were still, you know, kind of like, this could be our guy. He's going to Europe, so... While this is all going on and he's getting ready to go and going over, they're realizing that he is, in fact, the Vienna Woods killer. But then he's already in L.A., um, so they basically just need to, like, wait till he comes back. And when he came back from his L.A. trip, he was, he was charged with 11 murders. So we had the seven before he went. There was three in L.A., and then so they must have found another one at some point. He was convicted of nine of the 11 murders, and he was sentenced to life in prison without parole on June 29th, 1994. He didn't want a life in prison, so just six hours after his conviction, he hung himself in his cell. He used the same knots that he used when he killed the women. An Austrian psychiatrist, um, Dr. Renard, or Dr. Renhard Haller, diagnosed him with narcissistic personality disorder in 1990. Prior to his death, Unterweger had said that, you know, if he was convicted, he would seek an appeal. And therefore, under Australian law, his guilty verdict was not considered legally binding after his death. So I had to read that and, and digest that a few times. Because he was convicted but stated right away that he was going to appeal. It's kind of like in Europe, and I don't know if this is, I don't think it's similar in the U.S. at all, but in Europe, they're saying that if you say, I'm going to appeal, like you don't agree, that until that appeal process is done, you're actually not convicted. Like, you're still in jail and things, but you're not a convicted murderer until that appeal process goes through, or if you just decide not to appeal. So... <laughs> I don't get it. I definitely think I sh need to look up the differences between the U.S. and um, Europe in terms of those sort of things. So that's really all there is to talk about in terms of his crimes. But what I wanted to end the video with is I alluded to it in the beginning of my video. There was this idea that he was, you know, trying to copy Richard M Ramirez and the Night Stalker and that's why he came to the Cecil Hotel and that's why... You know, he was attracted to L.A., but, like, I call crap on that, and here's why. A, Richard Ramirez, he assaulted, killed, murdered, mutilated indiscriminately. There was no rhyme or reason. He didn't have a target. It was usually out of opportunity. So, with Unterweger, not only did he have a history of assault, but he was convicted of a murder before he even, before we even knew about the Night Stalker. He was already, he was in jail during that time. So he was already a killer. So it's like, oh, you're a copycat killer to someone who you don't even know is a killer yet. And Jack Unterweger definitely had a target. He definitely had a group of people that he targeted and that was prostitutes or sex workers. Um, those were the women he attacked. Those were the women that he murdered. You know, it's probably safe to say that his mo mother was a prostitute or a sex worker, and he may have had feelings about that, you know, which would not be unusual. Serial killer or not, it would not be unusual to start to harbor some type of negativity towards a group of people based on someone important in your life. You know, for instance, if you had a bad experience with an alcoholic parent um, or an alcoholic partner, maybe in general, anyone that you think is an alcoholic, you may have just a global distaste for. So that is an unusual, but he targeted prostitutes. And it's like, you can say, sure, you came to LA and 
the Cecil Hotel because the Night Stalker, Richard Ramirez, was there. But the Cecil Hotel in general has a very weird and sketchy history, and you can watch that video. I'll link it right here. Um, but also, it was a good place in general. Like, the whole scheme, I think, other than the fact that it was a scheme for murder, the scheme was brilliant to say you're a writer, and he was. He was... He was a writer, an acclaimed writer in Europe. So even if someone was searching him, they wouldn't have known that part of it. They would have seen that he was a writer. He's being sent over here. He's he's a crime writer, so him wanting to write about crime. And like I said, it wasn't unusual for European uh, reporters to be sent to the U.S. and vice versa. Um, it would be interesting to see what the comparison was because, you know, Europe and America do have different views, you know, on drugs in general, uh, sex work in general, all those that different thing. So it would have been a good story. Actually, it would have been a good story, a legitimate story. So then to ask for a ride along and be introduced to your victims, like that is just next level to me. That is just next level. And I'm not sure who the police officer was. This poor police officer he literally led this predator to his victims and he obviously didn't think anything of it you know jack didn't um raise any red flags for him so the whole thing to me is just next level but i don't feel like it, he was being a copycat i think he was a murderer i think he targeted a, a specific uh demographic a a specific group of women who engaged in sex for money and he sought them out and killed them because he wanted to. Well, that's my thoughts about the Jack Unterweger case, also known as the Vienna Woods Killer. Um, if you, you know, what are your thoughts? What do you think of this case? Um, what do you think so far of the cases in this series? Uh, if there's another case that you want me to cover, just go ahead and put that down below. If you haven't subscribed, please do so. I'm going to try to put these true crime videos up at least once a week. Try. Um, I do upload three times a week. And so if you want to become one of my little subbies, I'd love it. And thank you for watching. I will see you in my next video. Bye.